one complaint that I have about EPF. Their app is good, but actually their online offering sucks. How come suddenly we are listing Bakute as a heritage food? Is it actually even worth discussing? Because it's just... We're here on the Are We OK podcast, the podcast that talks about politics and public policy in ways that are relevant to you. My name is Ken Ming. And I'm Peter from Mr. Money. So how's life? All good. I just came back from India and Singapore and uh, we'll talk about it, uh, you know, in the content of uh, today's podcast. Mm. Uh, but before we go into that, you know, just want to like to thank Zeus Coffee again for sponsorship. Uh, you know, yes. always appreciate it. Questions. Yes. Now, firstly, uh, before we ask audience questions, maybe I want to ask you one question first. Mm. This is the first time that I'm seeing you dress so well. Yeah, I have a couple of uh, more formal meetings with a few CEOs. You know, this is the CEO kind of, uh, I have a quote, but you know, that, that's in the car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let us ask a question from our audience last week. Uh, since we were talking about the Ringgit last week, uh, many people actually recall the incident in 1997 of mm. our Asian financial crisis. Mm. So during the, that time, there was this huge perception that we have that was spread around was mm. that um, Mahathir actually took a drastic measure to actually freeze the ringgit exchange. Yeah, peg it, yeah. peg the exchange. Peg it. Uh, yeah, 3.8. Uh, 3.8, yeah. 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 Now it's at 4.0. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, during that time, uh, Anwar Ibrahim, uh, our current PMX, actually was misled by the US to actually increase the ringgit He followed interest. the IMF. Uh, yeah, followed yeah. the IMF. So there was all these uh, questions that were going around. Maybe you can share with us a little bit on uh, your opinion uh, in the more uh, policy terms. Like, actually, what, what, what do you remember? What do you remember from the Asian financial? Were you old enough to remember? I was old enough to remember the whole Inflasi Sifa thing. Mm. Yeah, but I definitely did not know what are all the internal things and news because I was just nine years old. Yeah, so for me, uh, I was directly affected by it because I was studying in UK at the time. Oh. Uh, in London, uh, so you know, so defin- literally you saw the yeah, of course, and then uh, you know, uh, some of my friends were in trouble. Their their parents had to borrow to get and uh, fund their final year of ex- of school fees. I was fortunate that my parents, you know, uh, they they could afford to even uh, allow me to continue my masters in in Cambridge. Uh, but yeah, I was definitely affected by it, and I also had a front line seat because. Anwar actually visited the UK during uh, the 1997 crisis and there was also a political crisis happening at that time and uh, you could see that he was under pressure already. And then between 98 and 99, uh, I was also uh, you know, working as an intern at the Monetary Authority of Singapore uh, mm. between, between my, my undergrad and master. So at the time, once the currency... Uh, you know, PAC was uh, institutionalized uh, and put in place by Mahathir. You could see a lot of Malaysians going to Singapore at that time. And I saw a few of my friends uh, <laughs> in, in, uh, in uh, Singapore looking very ashen-faced, you know, because they had to take out their, uh, their deposits and then put it back uh, in, in Malaysia because there was going to be a, a freeze in terms of those right. kinds of transactions. So right. I, I think on hindsight, uh, there have been other studies that have come out to show that uh, there was maybe some merit in what Mahathir did uh, in trying to protect the ringgit at that time. Uh, and even World Bank and IMF, uh, I think they grudgingly concede that there may be times when these currency controls or capital controls has to be implemented. But I also say at the same time, uh, there are re- repercussions in the sense that the market remembers. Mm. So, uh, you know, uh, that's why even now, with the ringgit falling to 4.8, 4.7, uh, there's a big resistance even among the central bankers, uh, central bank of not wanting to even talk about the institutionalization of the peg. Can, can you share with me, right? Like, uh, when you've looked at so many different countries, uh, we are the very few or the only country who actually did that peg during that time, right? Yes. Some actually, on the hindsight, when they look back, they say, hey, actually, it probably was a good move, but it came together with some issues. But also at the same time, right? What do you think could have been done better that prolonged this economic longevity of Malaysia? Because what happened is the Malaysia economy actually went up quite fast, but subsequently it just went stagnant. Yeah, so it definitely stabilised the, the country's economic position. Uh, but as a result of the currency pack, uh, what I think happened after that was that FDI was uh, negatively affected. People would not want to bring their money into the country for investment. Either portfolio uh, definitely would be hard, uh, or even FDI in the manufacturing and services sector. Because... They have this uncertainty. If I take the money in, if I make profits, can I actually repatriate the pro- mm. profits back to my HQ? So I think we we had some difficulties around that time. And I think because of all the uh, political problems uh, that was facing uh, the then Prime Minister, Dr. Mahate, he was also not able to find a sound economic narrative uh, after the crisis. So some people argue that, look, uh, you know, South Korea was similarly hit, uh, but they rebounded very quickly. They did not need to have a currency peg. 
uh, and because their industrial base was very strong, they were able to go ahead and uh, grow their manufacturing sector, uh, you know, have a lot of innovation. And then later on, we have these uh, giants like Samsung and Hynix and, and uh, LG doing very well. So it really depends on, you know, which perspective you're looking at. So, so just a last question here on this topic of the Asian financial crisis, right? Was that uh, when I was reading articles about it and uh, even watching movies, right? They kind of like bring in some of those days when your <coughs> events. Sure. They say that because uh, Co South Korea actually took IMF's uh, help, mm. right? During that time, uh, what happened is that they had to actually lean down a lot of things. And because of that, in the past, there were a lot more chebols, mm. the rich family that controlled the industry. And because of that, some chebols actually get really affected. Yeah, they and had the to power, close down, merge, and yeah, all that. Further <laughs> consolidate. And yeah, so a lot of uh, rich were significantly affected. Yeah, so I, I think the, the sort of like uh, argument that some people may make against the currency controls was that it protected some GLCs and even the government from making necessary reforms uh, that you know could have under been undertaken if we had swallowed the bitter pill. So... Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in terms of trying to improve the processes of uh, government procurement, increasing transparency, those were things that the IMF uh, prescribed, yeah. right? Uh, and if, let's say, again, just to play devil's advocate, if, let's say, those controls were put in place, would one MDB have happened, right? <laughs> so I, I think these are things that, you know, we need to take a more holistic kind of a look. Uh, and there are uh, both pros and cons. But I think moving forward, I don't think uh, there is a need for us to, yeah. uh, you know, have capital controls. Uh, I think the situation hopefully is under control with Bank Negara, MOF, and uh, hopefully, I think if we can tide through this uh, difficult ha first half of the year, I think second half, there will be uh, you know improvement in the ringgit position. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, this one also has to do with uh, ringgit a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in terms of a policy suggestion. So mm -hmm. this person said that he agrees that uh, the ra subsidy rationalization will give actually more headroom uh, for us, mm -hmm. but shouldn't we also considering lowering OPR? Mm. This will help to build, boost the GDP growth. Yeah. And although it might cause a short-term depreciation for Malaysian ringgit against the USD, but this will create more fiscal space mm. uh, to actually grow the country. And in the long run, it could actually help the country's economy. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So if let's say you think from the perspective of the Monetary Policy Committee and, and Bank Negara, uh, I can draw you a little bit behind the curtain. I'm not sure exactly what goes on in there, but I can sort of like guess. For them, their deliberations will be focused on what is the expected impact of uh, the lowering of the OPR on, let's say, economic activity as well as inflation. Those are the two main factors, right? So if you look at, let's say, inflation, actually inflation has modulated, has moderated. Uh, it's not as high as it was last year, uh, but there still may be a potential for inflation to, to increase. Uh, especially if, let's say, you know, we have the fuel subsidy rationalization. So that is actually one reason why you don't want to lower the OPR. Because you lower the OPR, there will be uh, stimulus in, ex uh, mm. in, in demand. Then suddenly, inflation may even that's increase right. more. So that's one thing. Second thing is, uh, if, if you look at the economic conditions uh, for 2024, most economists project that uh, the second half, there will be a pickup in E&E &E exports. Uh, there will be a pickup in you know consumer activity. Uh, so if, let's say, the, the economic Indicator seems to be okay, and the governor of uh, Bank Negara, uh, uh, Dr. Rashid, has indicated as such. Then there's no need for us to decrease OPR to stimulate more economic mm. activity. It should be okay for now. And of course, the, the third thing, the elephant in the room, uh, could be the effect of lowering OPR on the ringgit. You want to lower our OPR when the US hasn't lowered theirs. Uh, the di interest rate differential between uh, the US and Malaysia would grow even bigger and then we may have to end up in a situation where Bank Negara has to even spend more resources and, and Forex to defend the ringgit from uh, depreciating even further. Mm. So I think uh, that view uh, needs to be understood in the context of larger factors. That's right. Yep. Yeah, I think sometimes the economic is really a complex web of uh, stuff happening. Uh. Uh, Interrelationships, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I think this is where some economics training is helpful because, uh, you know, I, I've worked uh, as an intern in a central bank I've uh, worked in a consulting uh, firm. I've, you know, you know, have uh, some economics uh, training. So I'm able, hopefully, to explain this uh, better to you guys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Now, the last question that we picked for today is actually from this guy who is in the biological data science industry. So he said this, uh, can you have 
Stephen Sim, the HR minister, to talk about the brain drain living Malaysia because uh, he's one year into the industry in bioinformatics, which is biological data science. And what he see is actually low wages, fewer opportunity in research due to lack of funding. Mm. Um, hope they'll be able to talk about R&D in the science industry. Now, um, when he talk about this, it kind of totally reminds me of some of my friends. I remember at one point... Uh, Biomedics was a very popular field. Yeah, biomedicine. Yeah. Yep. yeah, during my time, la, right? Mm. Uh, the eight, I'm an 80s kid, so 2012, yeah. that yeah. period, yeah, pharmaceutical, <coughs> biomedical, those are few fields that uh, people biotech, really, yeah. yeah, biotech, people mm. went to it. And what happened is that many of them, once they graduated, mm. they came out of Malaysia. Mm. Cannot find jobs. They cannot find jobs. And yeah. the job they got was lab tech. Yeah, correct. It was 1,800, 1,500. Yep. And they spent like half a million studying it. Mm. So eventually, most of them either went to sales mm. uh, or I, like pharmaceutical sales and so yeah, on, yeah. or either they left and went to Singapore. Yeah, correct. Right. So what are your thoughts on this? Is this situation improving in Malaysia? Okay. Uh, yeah, first of all, I think many others have expressed interest in wanting to get Stephen Sim on this show. Uh, many <laughs> questions to ask him. So Stephen, if you are watching this, uh, you know, welcome to again, uh, sit on this couch. Maybe we'll get a bigger couch for you to come and yes, sit on Yes, please it. come over. <laughs> okay. Uh, to, to answer your question, again, I have had some discussions among uh, certain people in this, uh, you know, uh, biology ecosystem. Uh, and there are ways in which we can grow the ecosystem in the way that he suggested. So, for example, uh, Malaysia is actually a pretty good place to roll out uh, you know, testing for pharma pharm pharmaceutical products. Mm. Why is that the case? Because our testing procedures under the NPRA uh, is actually quite robust. And our documentation and all that is done in English. Right? So, if let's say, you know, a pharma company in China they want to uh, test their products in China. At the same time, they want to concurrently test their products in uh, Malaysia. Uh, they can actually do the same. And then the paperwork in Malaysia would be something that they can use at the international standard. Mm. Uh, so, you know, then that kind of standard can be used to uh, pass the relevant uh, tests and documentation to places like US and also to, uh, to the EU. Right, so that's one, one area where we can explore, you know, uh, and there's a commercial imperative uh, from that. Other companies that want to go and do this kind of testing for the Asian market, because not all drugs work the same, you know, between Caucasians and Asians. Yeah. Uh, Malaysia would be a good place because we have a multiracial mm. uh, composition, you know. So, so that I, I think would help, uh, you know, grow that industry. I know some people who are in that ecosystem, but uh, that person is right. Funding is not that much, uh, but there may be other ways in which private funding can come uh, and, and not be overly dependent on, on government funding. Maybe the last thing that I'd like to highlight here is other than uh, sort of like biotech, biomedicine, biostatistics is also very important, right? Because when you do this testing, you have a lot of data that's churned out, uh, you know, uh, different DNA sequencing and whatnot that needs a lot of computing power, that needs a lot of people who knows how to handle statistics. Uh, you, know, you may even try to bring in uh, generative AI into this ecosystem mm. right, to create your LLMs for these kinds of uh, uh, analysis, right? Uh, and use the kind of uh, data center capacity that YTL and others are building using NVIDIA chips, right? So if let's say, you know, we can also grow that ecosystem, uh, the biostatistics, uh, you know, big data analytics uh, type of uh, area, then suddenly this becomes much more attractive of, of a proposition. We may even collaborate with Singapore to roll out the ecosystem. Oh, so, so does that make sense or not? Yeah, and suddenly it sounds like uh, Johor is a very interesting uh, place to go over. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah I still remember they have this uh, whole... Um, uh, Iskanda area. Mm. I still remember they have this whole like a uh, medical city kind of place. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. education yeah. city. Yeah, education city is there, but yeah, yeah. So it's like yeah. So, so I just want to point out. Uh, thanks for your, all your suggestions because as you give these suggestions, right, I actually will incorporate them in my uh, policy discussions with the relevant people, uh, and maybe some of them will uh, you know end up being uh, actualized in terms of policy implementation. That's so, right. Watch this space. All right. Thank All right. you very much for the questions that you have asked. Now, let us take a short break. Uh, uh, wait, wait, wait. Any other questions that you want to, you know, do you want to talk about the Bakute issue or whatever? Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this one is a very interesting one, right? Okay. Yeah, so I, I have this question. How come suddenly we are listing Bakute as a heritage food? Uh, and is it actually even worth discussing because it's just heritage food? Uh, right? I think because we are policy-focused uh, podcast. Uh, even though, you know, this may be of interest from a sort of like more gossipy standpoint. I think the policy implications are not that great. Uh, yes, it's been politicized, but from an actual policy, uh, you know, discussion of Um, 
nowadays a lot of MPs are actually standing up on this and they say that no, there's no biggie about this whole thing. Mm. Uh, but I think that there could have also been a, a, a more united stance to say that, yeah, it represents a, a, a wider acceptance of Malaysians as Malaysia mm. and we are willing to accept. And having the right kind of MP, right, to, to actually also display the acceptance of uh, Islam as a religion that accepts everyone, mm. right, mm. as a human being and the love for it. Yeah, you and can. You yeah, can, it would be much more generous. Uh, actually, not MP. Nicer, uh, you, right? Actually, it's the tourism minister that. that <laughs> yeah, but maybe he's not the best spokesperson for this. Uh, yeah, that's you know, right. you can talk about Bakute, Chikute. Basically, it can be halal as well. You know, some MPs have brought it up in parliament, but uh, yeah, I mean. I uh, agree with you, uh, but maybe don't need to talk too much about it. That's right. Yeah. Let's take a break. We'll see you later. Hey guys, remember last week we had a giveaway of a 50 ringgit Zeus voucher for those who signed up to the Coffee Breaks newsletter. So we have picked the two winners that will receive this 50 ringgit Zeus voucher and will be in touch with you via email. So don't forget to check that email from the coffeebreak.co. If you do not win this round, don't be discouraged because we have another up coming giveaway this time it's gonna be a giveaway of 50 ringgit worth of bitcoin we are giving away to two random subscribers of the coffee break so go and sign up to the coffee break and we will pick out two of you check out the link to subscribe to the coffee break newsletter Hello everyone, welcome back to the Are We OK podcast where we talk about policies in a manner that's relatable to the people on the street. Now, Kian Ming, you have been having a very busy week last week. You have been flying here and there, <laughs> right? Yeah, I yeah. think one of the places you went to was uh, India. Yes. Yeah, you want to tell us like, what were you doing there? Sure, uh, this was actually my first trip to India. Have you been to India before? No, man. Ah, so I think it's some, a place that you, you should go. Uh, I went there, I flew into Delhi. And then, uh, you know, I was there for a conference that's organized by uh, what was previously called Brookings India, but now it's called the Center for Social and Economic Progress. Uh, and they took us uh, to a fort palace, F-O-R-T oh. palace uh, called Nimrana. It's a place uh, that's about two hours from Delhi on the way to Jaipur, a historic city. And uh, we had, uh, you know, two, two days of, two and a half days of conferencing there uh, and really exposed me to the confident India that I think uh, has arisen over the past uh, five years. Wow. Yeah. So I'm not sure whether you know, uh, they just announced the third quarter 2023 GDP figures uh, for India and they grew at 8.4%. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. Those kind of numbers you only see last time in China. Yeah, we. So now, uh, you know, uh, India is having that kind of uh, very high growth. Uh, it's the highest growth rate for a large country, uh, which sig signifies to me that, you know, India... Uh, you know, is this uh, sleeping giant that has already been awakened. Mm. Uh, so a lot of opportunities there in terms of investment. And when I was there, uh, a Taiwanese semiconductor company uh, that is uh, probably the second largest after TSMC, is called PSMC, uh, announced a joint venture with uh, Tata Electronics worth 11 billion US dollars uh, to build a semiconductor foundry. Uh, so, I mean, that's also supported by the Indian government and it shows to me that India that was traditionally known more for its services, its IT services, now is an important player in the uh, manufacturing sector as well. Wow. Yep. So, you know, good competition for Southeast Asia, including Malaysia, and perhaps uh, opportunities uh, to collaborate as well. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So, looks like uh, right now there's a lot being said that India is actually the next China, from mm. what I've been reading. Uh, so, what are your thoughts about it? Do you think that uh, they will be like the next China? I, I think they need to go through a phase of uh, domestic growth that is sustained for a longer period of time. And I think they would be able to do it. Uh, they have uh, general elections coming up later this year, I think in the middle of the year. Uh, and it's quite likely that uh, Pres uh, Prime Minister Modi's party, the BJP, will win again. And that will give them another five years of uh, solid uh, policy stability. Uh, definitely, uh, they will grow much more. But I think they're still very inward fo uh, focused. <coughs> One of the things that... Um, uh, you know that that I was really privileged to to witness was discussion with the minister for external affairs or the foreign minister of India who was present uh, at this conference. Uh, the content of what he say I can't reveal because it's Chatham House rules. Uh, but uh, you know he is somebody that I think is a very good representation of the new India. I think very confident, very strident, very firm uh, in his uh, approach and his uh, his uh, you know demeanor. 
and also you know a very good spokesperson for the policies of uh, Prime Minister Modi. And he actually wrote a book called uh, Why uh, Bharat is Important. And this is mm. the first time I heard of the term Bharat, B-H-A-R-A-T. It's actually an old name for India. Oh. Right? And it shows, I think, the kind of uh, new India, the, the confident India that uh, the the government under Prime Minister Modi is trying to uh, project and the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Jai Shankar, is somebody I think uh, that more and more people are paying more attention to. Right. Yeah. So I yeah, see. I mean, if you can compare, you know, that kind of uh, confidence, international standing, you know, and then you look at maybe closer to home, there's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a difference there. La, yeah. Shan't go into details, but uh, yeah, no, from a policy perspective, I think... Uh, you know, if let's say we don't, uh, you know, have a very strong policy, policy, foreign policy foundation base, then the projection of Malaysia's image, uh, although I think uh, Prime Minister Anwar is doing a good job, it, it may be a little bit lessened if this uh, foreign policy ecosystem is not quite robust. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So mm. what would be that one takeaway that you think Malaysia can adopt uh, after going through that uh, conference there? Uh, look for opportunities to understand India better and, and also how to work with uh, different strategic partners in India. So, like you know, for for my university, uh, Taylor's, I think it would be good if we could host some events, uh, even inviting some of our friends that I got to know from the Center for Social and Economic uh, Progress (CSFSP). Uh, that would be part and parcel of the larger education process. And also, maybe interviewing some of the companies, in Malaysian companies that have been investing in India for a long time. So, for example, not sure whether you are aware. IGM, the construction company, mm. uh, they have been in, in India for a long time, building toll roads, other infrastructure. Uh, and, uh, you know, they've had some uh, growing pains, but I think uh, the, the India business is one that's quite profitable and sustainable. So it would be interesting to hear some of the Malaysian corporates uh, to see their strategy and direction in India as well. Mm. Nice. <coughs> yeah, uh, my impression of India is uh, one of the strongest one was when I read this book called The White Tiger. It was uh -huh. adapted to a Netflix movie subsequently. Yep. Uh, talking about the call centers. Ah, yeah, how, yeah. how this guy actually mm. risen up from a, a, a poor family and mm. then slowly working his way up and eventually owning a, mm, a, a, call whole, center. Yeah, yep. a call center with a transportation. Mm. So what he does is that uh, because of more and more call centers, so they needed uh, rental cars to ah. actually get back home. So he runs a whole rental car business. Ah, very yeah. entrepreneurial. Huh? Ah, very yeah. entrepreneurial. So it, it kind of brought me to this whole like, wow, very interesting landscape in India, mm. which I think eventually, yes, very high chance uh, because as I was reading about it lately is that China is struggling with uh, higher wage higher costs cost, yes. yeah? Yeah. Uh, and lower birth rates. Mm. So it's losing its advantage. Uh, so it needs to evolve again. But India kind of have the roadmap of how they did it, so it's should sure. be... Yeah, of course, uh, yeah. India is a much more uh, noisy democracy. I think uh, <laughs> uh, challenges with infra will continue to be there. You know, it took me about like two and a half hours to travel about 120 kilometers. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, that trip in Malaysia in the, on the highway would have taken probably about uh, an hour, 15 minutes at most, la, <laughs> or, an, or an hour and a half. So, but I, I think they're improving very quickly. And of course, the soft power projection of India is still... I think uh, underappreciated. You know, we know about their Bollywood strength. Uh, you know, uh, Slumdog Millionaire. I'm sure you've oh, uh, yes. you know, heard, yeah. and uh, you know all the all 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 the Bollywood stars that have gone on to uh, to Hollywood. You know, uh, you know Priyanka Chopra, for example. And my my own personal sort of like uh, uh, focus is actually in the chess scene, where mm. I'm quite sure within the next five years uh, there will be a new chess uh, champion from India. Uh, to replace the legend uh, called uh, Vishwanathan Anand, Vishi wow. Anand. So there are about four or five uh, very promising young, uh, you know, uh, Indian chess players, uh, Vidit, uh, uh, Gukesh, uh, Praganananda, and a few others that I'm sure, you know, would give uh, the top players wow. from, the Amer from America and from uh, China their run for the money. Wow, so it looks like uh, India is conquering the world. They already conquered the uh, uh, top CEO position uh, for the all US, the big yes. companies. Tech companies, They're yeah. They're going to conquer also the chess scene. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah and, and you know, there's a, there's a prime minister in uh, in uh, the UK who was uh, of <laughs> Indian descent. So, yeah, look yeah. out for India and, uh, you know, it's it's the, the sleeping giant that's already been awakened. That's right. Now, now in, since we are talking about uh, other countries, uh, let's also bring in another country, the uh. one that's very near to us, yes. our neighbor Singapore, right? Which you also made your trip there. Oh, yeah, well, I went to in, I went to Singapore after India for an <laughs> investors uh, briefing, talking about the SEZ. Yeah. Yes. Although you did not, you're you're not there for the hottest thing, which, which is, is a Taylor Swift concert. 
Yeah, you went to another thing. Yes. Yeah, um, how's how's the ground like? Because uh, just right before you went, uh, mm. there was this whole hoo ha about like Singapore paying an exclusive deal to Taylor Swift mm. to actually host her concert there yep. alone, only in Southeast Asia. Yep. And when you went there for the conference, uh, do you hear any chatters and uh, stuff like that? Because neighboring countries got quite salty la, including Malaysia la. Sure. Uh, I actually saw the concert from my hotel room. Oh. And from my hotel room, I could see the Kalang Stadium and then all the lights and the fireworks, you know. I couldn't oh. hear anything because the soundproofing was very good. It was a nice hotel, you know. Uh, so I saw it from a distance. And then when I spoke to the different cab drivers that I, you know, uh, you know got into, uh, they also told me, yeah, this is, uh, you know, a good move by the Singapore government. Uh, they can see a lot, a lot of tourists coming in for this event. Uh, and, you know, it, it was uh, such a big issue uh, you know, when, uh, you know, the Thailand Prime Minister and some lawmakers from Philippines uh, even, uh, you know, asked, you know, why is it that, you know, uh, other countries were denied the the, uh, the opportunity to host Taylor Swift? So much so that Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong had to make a, make a <laughs> clarification on this uh, during the, uh, you know, his trip to, to Australia for the ASEAN uh, Australia Conference or the summit, whereby he said that, look, you know, this is, um, you know, um, what... Uh, you know, this, the Singapore government wanted to do from a tourism incentives perspective. Uh, whether or not Taylor Swift were, would have gone to other Southeast Asian countries, I think he said, you know, that is for Taylor Swift to decide. Uh, and, you know, they, they saw a good deal and they, they went there to, to get it. Uh, this was facilitated by uh, the Singapore Tourism Board and uh, the Minister for uh, Youth and Community Development, Edwin Tong, a lawyer by training, uh, you know, also I think uh, was part and parcel of this uh, pitch. And I think what I saw in Singapore, maybe those who didn't go to Singapore for, for the concert may not have seen, is that it's not just the concert, you know. They had this new era, this, uh, this uh, you know, uh, Eras Tour exhibition at the Marina Bay Sands, oh. where I was having, uh, you know, my, my conference. Um, <clears throat> they had a fireworks a display with uh, Taylor Swift music at the Marina Bay area. Uh, with, Ooh, wow. This is at the, you know, where, where the Malayan is. So all the lights and all that in the evening. Uh, you had people camped outside the stadium, even those who didn't have tickets, uh, part, part and parcel of the festivities that were there. So it's not just like attending the concert. There's this whole other ecosystem that the Singapore government built around right. uh, the, the concert. Uh, similar to F1, right? And in fact, uh, one cab driver made a very astute observation. You see, for F1, uh, the the expenditure cost in terms of bringing in the teams, in terms of having to set up the infrastructure and all that, right, is actually quite expensive. You have to put up the barriers because it's a road race. But for Taylor Swift, there's no capex involved. You just mm. come to the stadium. Yes, we pay you total. You know, Prime Minister Lee said about two three million uh, Singapore dollars extra to make it an exclusive deal. But it's part and parcel of that larger ecosystem, right? And and the capex is actually, uh, you know, very low. But mm. the the multiplier effect is huge. That's true. Actually, one thing that uh in the Singapore's statements when they made, talked about it, they talk they use these words culture. They were saying they're trying to build Singapore in the cultural hub, right? And now they say it, right? It's quite surprising because yeah, even the Malayan there, they're actually playing Taylor Swift song. It it kind of tells you that they're trying to build this whole like celebration of culture, of international culture there kind yes. of thing. They're, they're trying to make literally Singapore the centre of Southeast Asia. Or center the center of, of, yeah, for entertainment yeah. and other. <clears throat> so for example, um, you know, later this year, Trevor Noah is going to be performing in Singapore. <laughs> mm. I, I think my wife has bought tickets, uh, uh, but I don't think she got tickets for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I, I think from a policy perspective again, you know, people ask, you know, why did we lose out? We don't have the ecosystem for this kind of thing. Yeah. You know, even you know the the firm that was uh, trying to bid for it said that Malaysia was never offered uh, this package because the ecosystem and the 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 sort of like a larger publicity around uh, our environment to host these events is not just is just not there. And then when you know international artists hear about the presence of a kill switch, <laughs> obviously that's not going to attract them to come. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Uh, you know, yes, there's certain politics involved, uh, but I think if let's say we really want to uh, play a complementary role or have our have our ability to actually host these events from and and generate more multiplier effects, right? Then we have to get our act together. Yeah. I I do realize that when it comes to Singapore, right, even this kind of like things are uh, when when usually in Malaysia it's a few private event organizer bringing in the people, right? But in Singapore, it's kind of like everything, uh 
it's a collaboration <laughs> between private companies and government. And yeah. Like almost big, big, small, small also is a collaboration between private companies and government to make it happen. But in Malaysia, it's kind of like the private sector wants it and then they have to apply their license. What are your thoughts about this actually? So this is something that I think you probably don't know. <clears throat> the Singapore Tourism Board is an agency that sits under the Ministry of Trade and Industry. They don't oh. have a tourism minister. So for, for Singapore, tourism is trade. trade. So this is actually you know industrial policy in action uh, in terms of the Taylor Swift concert. So when, when it comes time to promoting tourism, uh, you know, MICE events, different tourism products, uh, it is a whole of government approach yeah. being driven by the Ministry of Trade uh, and Industry. So for them, under the government cabinet itself, tourism is seen as one of the business rather than a cultural thing. Yes, correct. Mm. Unlike so Malaysia, tourism is a cultural uh, thing, right? Yeah, it's seen as yeah. cultural, not really, you know. A business. Yes, exactly. Yeah, although then, there's business involved, but yeah. yeah. No, but, and, and then <clears throat> for these concerts, it's under the Ministry of Communications. Right? So it's separate from tourism. And as far as I can see, I don't think the two are working together to do this kind of uh, facilitation. Mm, yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Now, just by looking at some of the statistics and some of the numbers, right? Apparently, this concert is bringing in about uh, 500 million Singapore dollars mm -hmm. just in tourist receipt alone. Uh, I think it's going to be more, yeah. which means that it's going to also generate a lot of tax for the government and boost the local economy. And... What happened is that I was reading about this. Uh, they say that the Nomura Economist actually wrote in February that uh, both Taylor Swift and Coldplay Plate itself, two major concerts in 2024, are actually contributing 0.25 percentage point GDP. to GDP. Yeah. Which, which, which is mind-blowing yeah. in my opinion. <laughs> okay, so, so <clears throat> definitely hotel rates would have gone up double, 50%. Uh, I didn't have to pay for my hotel, so I don't know how much it costs. But uh, uh, I think it's also important to know that there are also other multiplier effects that affect the man on the street. So the cab driver is That's very right. happy. Uh, the people with, uh, you know, in the F&B sector, they're very happy. Very happy. Right? So it's not just the people at the top, the big hotels that enjoy this, but it's also others in the ecosystem. Yeah. And if, let's say, the hotels do well, then they are going to be able to give uh, bigger bonuses to their staff and then the staff will be happy. And of course, some of that staff will be Malaysians who are going there from <laughs> Singapore and other places <laughs> contributing to, to the brain circulation. Well, having said that, uh, one of my staff is actually in Singapore right now to attend the Taylor Swift concert. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> she's so contributing to she, that. Yeah, to she's that, contributing uh, to the uh, <laughs> Singapore economy. Sure. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, one thing that's really funny after all this, right? Mm was to see the response of different political party. Ah, okay. For the first time suddenly, mm. not for the first time, <laughs> but interestingly, Bersatu <laughs> Correct. has called the unity government to mm. answer for Malaysia's failure to secure this highly anticipated Taylor mm. Swift concert. Mm. Uh, so, Sasha Lina Abdul Latif, uh, their legal and constitution bureau deputy chairman, uh, mm. she called for an answer from our PM and youth and sport minister, Henayo, to be responsible. But interestingly, when Coplay wanted to come here, they are the ones who made the most noise and uh, they are the ones who apply, uh, ask for the kill switch. Lah. So uh, I was wondering, right? Like, maybe you can take us behind the curtains <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, Maybe you should name this podcast Behind the Curtain. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh. let's play a little bit uh, Behind the Curtains, okay, okay. right? Um, yeah. Here's where I get very confused sometimes as a citizen where mm. it, it, it made politics look a little bit clownish sometimes mm. is that when they don't secure it, you're going to make a big hua. When they secure it, you're going to say that it spoils our culture. Mm. So you're putting, like almost you're trying to put a trap. You're just trying to make noise, right? Mm. Sometimes. So uh, how genuine are their statement and how does it actually work? Okay, so for this particular politician from Busatu, uh, she's made certain statements in the past that uh, I think uh, what I would consider to be quite progressive. La. Right. Uh, things about uh, citizenship rights and, and things of that nature. Uh, so, you know, there are people, I think, within Bersatu that, uh, you know, can maybe see the opportunity to talk about things that uh, perhaps are not followed by this unity government, uh, where they, where the unity government, especially Pakata Harapan, were advocating for when they were in opposition, mm. right? So, I, you know, this is quite a good sort of like strategy in terms of uh, going into that space to, 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 to fill up that space where uh, it was uh, empty before. Then the other thing that I think is important to note uh, is... There is also a separation of PAS between Bersatu and PAS. So you would never find a PAS MP come out to support a concert for Taylor Swift or ask this kind of question. But Bersatu is usually given that kind of role because they play the role of 
less of the religious part, more of the nationalistic part. Uh, and for, for this, I think it's also a matter of trying to uh, project Bersatu as a more inclusive uh, you know, middle ground party. Right? So that is the division of labor also. And that is why actually PAS, even though uh, you know, uh, it may not see eye to eye with Bersatu on a lot of things, including Muhyiddin's leadership, uh, but they still require Bersatu to be there to say things that they cannot say. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but wouldn't it cause this like whole image where people look at it and say that you are, you guys are just contradicting each other? So how on earth can a contradicting party come together and rule a nation? Uh, well, I would say that <clears throat> in the past, uh, when DAP or other parties in Pakatan were in opposition, sometimes we will have leaders that have different viewpoints as well. Uh, so I think it's a matter of what the top leaders say in terms of communicating the overall direction of the the party. Uh, but I think given the fact that Taylor Swift in the larger politics doesn't really warrant a uh, response from uh, the leader of uh, Bersatu or PAS, I don't think they will comment on it. So it's okay, lah. you let the other people go and play in this space. I'm sure some MP will bring this up uh, in parliament and they will kecho kecho about it. But <laughs> you know, again, for me, the important thing is actually the larger policy ecosystem. Do we have uh, the kind of policy uh, you know, ecosystem and environment to be able to attract more of these uh, entertainment activities uh, to Malaysia. Mm. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a very specific example. Uh, you know, Dr. Jason Leong, he's yeah. a comedian, a good friend of mine. <coughs> um, yeah, nice guy, but not a very good poker player from, from my personal experience. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, he, he's now uh, based in Singapore. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, he finds that the environment there is much better, much less uh, to worry about. You know, yeah. and, you know, he's contributing to that brain circulation. Uh, but I wish him well, you know, Dr. Jason. Thanks for being a friend, and I uh, wish you all the best in Singapore. Uh, and look forward to you know your show later on this year in Malaysia. Right. Yeah. So I guess that's all about it when it comes to Taylor Swift and uh, foreign country stuff. Uh, let's take a quick break, and later we'll come back and we'll discuss about the Bumi Putra Economic Congress. Be right back. Hey guys, welcome back to the Are We OK podcast. Uh, we are here to talk about the seventh edition of uh, this congress that took place uh, recently. Before we go into the content, uh, you know, just from a layman's perspective, uh, you know, what is your impression when such events are being held? For me, it's like, oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, it's probably one of those events where it's just going to give a lot of goodies to the Bumi Putra community. Mm. Yeah, and to... In this time round, it's a little bit different in my opinion. The current government has been in a little bit of pressure in terms of saying that like, hey, are you taking care of the Bumi Putra enough? Mm. Right? So it's the best time for PM to actually showcase his uh, care and love for the Bumi Putra community. This is the first time that this has caught my attention. In the past, I just see it as just another event. I, yeah. I think in the past, because it's always been sort of like a no led uh, there's always a very nationalistic agenda. Uh, and uh, from my perspective, and I have been keeping track of this quite closely ever since it was announced last year, uh, there are a couple of things that are different about this Congress. Firstly, the optics. The optics matter because sometimes people see more than they understand. So one of the important points that uh, PM Anwar did was he invited non Bumi Putras to attend the Congress. Mm. Uh, whether it's people from the business community, uh, I saw... Uh, Minister Gobin Singh there, uh, Liu Chintong was on a panel together with Joe Gani at the end of the co the Congress. So at least from an optics standpoint, you know, there were Orang Asli involved, Sabah and Sarawak. It's not so Malay-centric, right? It's more inclusive. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, and I think from a content standpoint, I actually downloaded all of the slides uh, that were presented. It's out in, uh, you know, it's uh, on the Ministry of Economy website. Uh, the, the the points that, were talk uh, that they spoke about were actually quite... Um, I think uh, well grounded in terms of statistics. Tan Sri Abdul Wahid, uh, the Busa chairman, also brought out some of the uh, you know gaps in terms of mm. uh, professionals uh, from the Bumi Putra community. You know, so I, I think the way it was organized this time was much more. I think uh, with uh, attention to a certain level of inclusivity and also a greater level of uh, professionalization. Mm. Yeah. So would, would if let's say you know those were the things that were presented. Uh, you know, in in terms of some of the substance. You know, would would you as a as a Chinese person who's sort of like a middle of the road uh, person, your views, uh, but also an entrepreneur, you know, and based on what you've seen from uh, Anwar's, uh, you know, sort of like points, what is your further reaction? Uh, I thought it was pretty good actually. Okay. Because uh, I read a few statements, mm -hmm. uh, and one of the statement was said that 
they are more rich Malay politician than they are uh, they public are. listed company <laughs> owners or Malays, and sure. and and that that actually made me like wow, this is conducted in genuine rather than purely a political tool to just ah, ah, ah like that, right? Yeah, and because this time around, like you say, they were like non boomies entering and there were different kind of boomies as well. So it made it a lot more inclusive. And in my opinion, I think it's a great thing because mm. as a Malaysian, I actually do feel that I agree because statistically, the Bumi Putra are, are the, the ones, majority. Yeah, the majority and they are the ones who... Uh, Many of the hardcore poor are also coming from the Bumi Putra community. Yeah. yeah. So it's great that we share the 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 knowledge and the cultural uh you know, mm-hmm. just enjoy it together and then help out each other. Lah. Correct. So I think that's a great thing. Yep. So uh, actually uh, just to let the audience know, uh, one of the reasons why I think uh, that there was a greater level of professionalization of this congress is that the they divided the topics into ten clusters. So you have uh, education reform and human capital. You have uh, uh, the strengthening of halal industry. You have uh, rural development. You have uh, empowerment of the orang asli communities. Uh, you have uh, Sabah and Sarawak. You know, uh, so you know that there's there's sort of like a, a greater emphasis on making sure that there are different clusters or different sectors that are taken care of or looked at. Uh, and again, drawing you behind the curtain, I was actually invited to uh, one of the roundtables that was uh, organized by. Uh, Tan Sri No Azlan Ghazli, who was the former VC of UKM, and now he runs a unit uh, research center there called Minda. And he is in charge of the education reform and human capital cluster. Mm. So he actually invited a group of uh, um, a mixed crowd, both uh, Malays and non Malays, to talk about human capital development uh, in this Congress. Uh, and there were different people that were invited. Uh, you know, most of them attended in their individual capacity. People from corporate, people from different associations. Uh, and I was there to give my own views in terms of how we can improve the the substance of the discussion. Uh, again, giving you some insights, right? There were some non-Malay uh, associations, or, or rather, some associations that are comprised largely of non-Malays uh, in their leadership. Uh, that when invited to some to to some of these deliberations they were hesitant to go. And the reason why is that something like this Bumi Putra conference is actually very <coughs> divisive. From the perspective of the non-Malays, right, they would see this as a way for the Malays primarily, uh, you know, again, Amno Association is there, to try to uh, get more for themselves in a way that is rent-seeking, in a way that is not so positive to the larger uh, economic ecosystem. And this is because they've seen what has happened in the past. Certain companies linked to certain individuals get all these contracts and the economy doesn't benefit. Only certain people, maybe people with political connections, maybe politicians are the ones that benefit. right? And then on the part of the Malays who are looking at this, uh, they will also sometimes see, hey, even if let's say you want to shout and sing about Bumi Putra rights and all that, actually at the end of the day, whatever that filters down to me actually is not much. Yeah. Right. So it's like, you know, all these big talk and all that is the well-connected people up there who get to benefit. So I, I think that's why sometimes the, 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 the narrative coming out from these kinds of congress, right, is like a short-term boost, but uh, long-term, you know, uh, I, I think the we have to wait to see whether this there will be substantive results coming from this. Yeah, I think the key is still at the level where when it comes to giving out and really distributing the benefits to people, sometimes it gets very unclear. So what happens is that the man on the street who wants to benefit <coughs> from it find it very hard to obtain it, but it's the people with connection that actually gets it first, right? Yes. Yeah, and so that leads to a lot of disappointment. Like even when I was looking at like ASB, you know, um, um, for example, ASB financing, mm, right? Uh. I, I think that's a wonderful tool for for many uh, many any human being, like in my mm. opinion, right? And especially beneficial to Bumi Putra. Yeah, I think the it's SMEs wonderful, and all that. Right? Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, but. When I talk to the people on the street, right, many of them don't take advantage of it. Mm. They are not educated enough about it. So what happens is that when government comes up with a certain initiative to help the Bumi Putra community, right, I also realize that they don't spend enough effort to educate them on how to actually use it. Educate and do outreach, yeah, capacity and do outreach. building yeah, and all that. For example, even when we talk about, uh, I was talking to Penjana, right, the other day, and uh, Pen- Penaraju, Yasan Penaraju, yeah. or Yasan Penaraju, right? Yeah, which gives out scholarship. Yeah, this is under Ibrahim Sani. Yes, yeah. under Ibrahim Sani. And even then, it's not taken up fully, is it? it? It's, it's, people are not like, like, like they're not gung ho to get it. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking of myself, right? There are a million people who are like so gung ho and want to get it and they can't mm-hmm. get it. But the, the effort to outreach is not 
extensive enough. Maybe, maybe he's one of those guys that we can actually bring up to actually have a conversation sure, yeah, about. Yeah, I, I think uh, right. Ibrahim Sani, you know, is a very smart guy, yes, uh, well-meaning. Solid. Yeah, and you know, just to again give you a personal experience, just before the twenty twenty two elections, uh, there was a program uh, that was launched by uh, you know continued by EPF, whereby they would give four hundred and eighty ringgit to. Um, uh, uh, you know, people who are in the hardcore uh, poverty group, the Miskin Tega, that are on the eKase database, uh, you know, with the condition that they have to apply for it uh, through their EPF accounts. Uh, a lot of these people don't have access to information. And the EPF in, in Hulu Langat wanted to work with my office uh, for us to go and call and contact, you know, these about 500 uh, names that were under the Bangi constituency. And I said, yeah, let's do it. We can call them up, WhatsApp them, whatever. EPF doesn't have the capacity on the local level to do yeah. it. That's why they want to work with the, the MP's office. And they saw that I, I was somebody that, you know, uh, would have wanted to do this uh, without politicize, politicizing it. Lah. So we were going to do it. Uh, and then what happened was the parliament was dissolved. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that's another example of how, you know, there are a lot of policies out there that can actually help the Bumi Putra community. But for various reasons, it, it is not filtered down to the people who really need it. Maybe just to give you again another sense of the kind of uh, behind the curtain, uh, you know, uh, discussions. When it was first, uh, you know, announced that there will be another edition of this uh, Bumbutra Economic Congress last year, one of the MCA senators, uh, you know, actually issued a statement to say that, you know, we don't need such a congress. And then uh, one of the AMNO youth leaders came out to whack him, you know. And then I saw that, you know, we need to have a more substantive conversation about this. So I issued a press statement in December last year to say that, yeah, we need a Bumi Putra Economic Congress, but we need a different one. What do I mean by that? We actually need to have some sort of a more academic or substantive discussion on what has worked in the past uh, and what hasn't worked in the past. Yeah. Right? So you need to have some, you know, better study, you know, ask your think tank, some of your Kazana Research Institutes and the likes, you know, maybe working with some of the public and private universities to evaluate uh, what is the distribution uh, of money that you've given, given out through Tekun to, to Bumi Putra entrepreneurs, what has worked, what, what, has, what hasn't, what are some of the HR policies, best practices among some of the Bumi companies that have helped them uh, grow and retain talent, right? Yep. So all these things actually, I think, need to be there to make it a more than just a one shot congress and then there's no follow up mm. right and and i and, and and you know i i just want to give you one example i think you would still remember this the audience would know as well remember this initiative by isma sabri to set up these uh, digital malls for bumi putra entrepreneurs <laughs> yes <laughs> so the flagship one was in mara in uh, raja laut and it has failed that has failed other such initiatives in other places has also failed and and the reason is simple you know you to, to really make uh, these kinds of environments sustainable, you actually need the Bumi Putra entrepreneurs to work together with the non-Bumi entrepreneurs uh, to set up an ecosystem, to set up you know, uh, good collaborations uh, in ways that uh, are positive. Yes. Right. So I actually bothered to go and visit the digital mall last year, or sorry, the year before, uh, you know, to, to see the progress and a lot of the stores had closed down. A lot of the stores that were st still in operation were selling things like clothes and other things, mm. not the digital stuff. And <clears throat> this is in contrast to Lao Yat. If you go to Lao Yat, you have people from all races and nationalities That's right. there, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> even different nationalities. Yes. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the example that I gave is, uh, another example I gave is this um, uh, you know, company called IT Supermart. Uh, mm. You know, it's in many places. Uh, and many of the, the IT supermarts that I go to, right, the majority uh, the, the, is mixed stuff, but many of them are actually Malays. Yes. Right? And I, I think the ownership is uh, probably non Malay, uh, but they have a system whereby they can encourage and retain uh, Malay, uh, uh, Malay employees. And in that kind of mixed setting, everyone benefits. That's right. right. So why not look for some of these other good use cases, other cases, and try to share those examples with others? Uh, other companies where you know there is a symbiotic and positive relationship between uh, you know uh, Malay uh, entrepreneurs, uh, non-Malay entrepreneurs, and even non-Malay owners, uh, but working in in this kind of ecosystem where they can hire and uh, you know benefit Malay staff. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, yeah no, I, I think you know if let's say some of these things can be uh, you know uh, followed through in a more systematic manner. Uh, I think we'll get better results in the long term. Yeah, I think ultimately when it comes to this whole economic growth, when it comes to the Bumi Putra community, especially when it comes to the business area, um, I personally think that 
there's a lot of areas to improve. Yeah, mm. uh, especially just like you say, there's then there needs to be a lot of leverage between different cultures as well. Yeah, because put it this way, you can't deny the fact that there are many of the business that are much more older in Malaysia mm. are actually run by uh, different races, right? Uh, especially majority Chinese. Mm. Yeah, can't deny that. So leveraging mm. on that to actually get better and actually encouraging learning via different culture and so on. Just like Laoyat, right? Yeah. It actually is better because you, you get to learn from other people sure. and everyone gets to learn from each then other. Then they can look-see, like, look-see. Yeah. yeah, just like the Chinese community also need to learn how to uh, capture the Malay market. Yes. Right? Just look at Karu Aming, you know, these mm. kind of people, right? Mm. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic entrepreneurs, yeah. right? Yeah, and now, just to feedback on the channel itself, mm. our channel itself, it's all about policies, right? Mm. So, I think it's time that we run through some of the things that uh, Prime yeah. Minister yep. Ibrahim Please actually announced a Bumi Putra Economic Congress. Yep. Uh, and let's give our opinions on it. Sure. Yeah, on some of the things that we like and don't like. I think the first thing is actually uh, 2 billion ringgit will be channeled to GLCs to scale up Bumi Putra business. I think that's standard. Lah. Uh, uh, wait and see. Lah. See what yeah. the processes are. See how the GLCs decide to deploy that. Yeah. You know, what is the structure. Yeah. So yeah, that was a very over, you know, top yeah, view standard, thing, standard, standard tough, yeah. right? Uh, endowment fund created, you know, again, it's similar thing. Now, the third one is the one that caught my attention and I think it's pretty good. Uh, to assist Bumi Putra youth to obtain jobs, the government is working GLC to train 100,000 workers under the TVET program who will then be offered jobs with minimum monthly wage of 3,005. Mm. For me, it's not enough. I feel like it should be 500,000, not 100,000. Yeah. It should be the main focus. No, but again, again yeah. the challenge is capacity. How do you want to roll it out to the different TVET institutions? We've had these kind of challenges for a long time already. So I was thinking to myself, right? Why not? Why why just limit to GLCs? Why not limit to why why not extend it? Yeah, to, to the private sector. To private sector, like yeah. I mean, if government were to tell me, like, hey, Finnet Media, why not you guys go and train a bunch of editor or social media marketers? Yeah, right? I, will, I will subsidize their wages. You know, I'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, please bring them in, yes. man. I'm gonna train them. <laughs> Yes. I'm gonna train them, yeah. Yes. So I I think that there's there's a lot more capacity that are underutilized in the Malaysian market. So first of all, on the GLCs part, I think different GLCs, including Kazana, PNB, have uh, undertaken some of these training programs. Uh, I think what would be useful is again, if let's say there was some academic or research study to show what is uh, beneficial, what is not. How have these uh, you know graduates gone on to? Uh, you know, uh, progress in their own career. Uh, which companies do they end up working for after they graduate from these programs? These are mostly graduates, uh, not not TVET. Uh, you know, those are the things that we need to explore, and also trying to uh, link together TVET institutions and, and and the private sector. This is something that is quite tricky, and I'll give you personal experience. Uh, when I was uh, MP for Serdang in 2013 for to 2018, I actually approached some of the TVET institutions that were in my constituency. I shan't name them, uh, but you know these are government agencies at the federal level to say that, look, let's run some programs. I'll pair some of your graduates with some of the industry people that I know, you know, people who are running factories in Blakong, in, in, in uh, Sri Kembangan and whatnot. They won't even talk to me huh? because at that time, you know, I was seen as the opposition. Right. Right. So, uh, but even now, I think if I, you know, approach some of them, uh, the capacity may not be there in terms of having that kind of uh, linkage. Uh, and I'm not sure to what extent other politicians have gone out to do this. Uh, but if let's say there are no good examples, there are no good use cases, there are no uh, systems whereby this kind of linkages can be, can be established, you can say all these motherhood statements and these KPIs, mm. uh, they will not filter down to the ground. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So my my personal experience uh, in, in this, not so much that I've worked with them, but rather from what I've observed and talking to people who came for interviews and uh, some of my viewers, I realized that when this program is being implemented and mostly with GLC and big companies, what happens is that under the big company, they actually take up these people, right? Because it, it is kind of like to, to give CSR. face. Uh, CSR. Lah. Yeah, and they don't pay them much. Seriously, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised at the amount that they pay them because yeah, it's below mm. their standard wage mm. that they will offer their fresh yeah, grad, yeah, right? Correct. Uh, they see it as a CSR program, yes. right? And they're not being given much responsibility, nor are they given much uh, opportunity to continue as a permanent. It's kind of like, one year done, they see you goodbye, I've done my job, right? Mm. Maybe, maybe out of 10, there are two that maybe can, that's right, they can take that's it. That's right. Yeah. But if they were to do it with smaller companies, uh. These companies really need people. Yes. And like, for example, not just my company, but there are other SMEs that I know, 
they really need people and they are going to give the attention to train these people yeah. and really give them retain the, them yeah retain them yeah. right maybe uh, out of 10 maybe they can get 5 retain yeah. 5 uh, so pay them yeah, higher wages maybe sometimes. it's hard to establish it but why not <coughs> maybe set up kind of like a, 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 a Surahan Jaya kind of thing or like a exo community kind of thing where we can go and apply and say that hey I would like to sure uh, employ employ you know, these yeah. kind of people yeah. uh, is there a program or where can I get these people you know mm. that kind of things mm. so maybe that can be done uh. yeah maybe yeah. What, uh, under the Ministry of Human Resources one of the agencies you know can do this you know the Perkeso, you know, they, they have a they have a jobs matching uh, yeah. website. You Looks know. like we really get uh, YB Stephen Simia. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So Stephen or Kelvin, if you're watching this, please uh, take note. Yeah, but maybe just one last example. Uh, I think we need to bring in, uh, you know, two groups of people that have always not been given the proper attention. Uh, the Orang Asli, I think, uh, yes. in terms of empowering them, it's a totally different ball game. Uh, we really need to understand their culture and their pain points. Uh, which even at this point in time, I don't think I, I, I am able to speak uh, credibly on, on this. I know some friends who are helping them to do uh, agriculture in their own uh, land and things like that. And then, and then later sell on their produce. Uh, uh, Langit, at, at, all this, right? Yes, a few yeah. others. Yeah, yeah, And yeah, I know the Langit people quite well. And then the other group is actually the Sabahans and the Sarawakians, mm. right? How do they uh, you know, um, get involved in different sectors of the economy? starting maybe at a lower base, but eventually moving up. And I'll give you one specific example of how, uh, you know, I, I tried to do this in my own constituency. Uh, in 2015, when I was MP for Serdang, I set up specially a morning market uh, in Sri Kembangan, specially for traders of Sabah and Sarawak origin. That means you can only uh, set up if you are originally from Sabah or Sarawak, you know, maybe husband and wife, or if husband from, from Sabah or Sarawak, wife is uh, Malayan, you know, from Peninsula, then that's fine as well. And they will be selling products uh, that are, uh, you know, specifically for the Sabah, from the Sabah. Oh, and you set that up? Uh, this is called Pasar Borneo Suri Kembangan. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, you're the one who set that up? Yes, I'm the one who set it up. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. the pengasas for okay, this. Okay, so you've heard of it. La. Yes, I've heard of it. Because um, I, I wanted to get some of the Sabah Sarawakian uh, stuff. Mm. Then they told me that there's this market in Sri Kembangan. So mm. all these Sabah Sarawakian will flock over there over the weekends just to get their stuff. Yes. Yeah. So I'm the one who set it up. Ah, I yeah, see, I yeah. see. If you ask the pengasas there, the, the guy who runs it, Nelson, and the other people, I think most of them still remember me. La. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think nice. those are sort of like more concrete things that we can do here in, in, in Peninsula. But of course, I think there are also other things that can be done in, in a bigger scale in Sabah and Sarawak. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah. I guess uh, just for the sake of it, I'm going to read the remaining ones sure. uh, just so that you guys know what is it. Mm. Yeah, but uh, we'll just not really comment about it. Lah. I think one more after that is actually to boost the acreage of Malay Reserve Land, 20 acre of land in Bandar Malaysia to be set aside to build affordable home. Uh, All that right, Pelaburan Hatana Berhad Permodalan National will be entrusted to undertake commercial projects on Malaysia <coughs> reserve land. Mm. Then, establishment of a gig worker commission to improve social protection and contract negotiation for 1.2 million gig workers, of whom mostly are Bumi Putra. The last one is really interesting with immediate effect. Government will issue a directive requiring all gifts and souvenirs to be handed out by the government and its agency to be sourced from Bumi Putra entrepreneurs. Yeah. So, uh, anything that you want to comment on? Okay, uh, so for all those land and property related, um, you know, initiatives, I think uh, they are not new. Uh, others have been proposed uh, in the past before, uh, but there are a lot of constraints that the marketplace may not be, that, that the audience may not be aware of. So, for example, if you want to set aside, uh, you know, any kind of commercial or housing developments specifically for the Bumi Putra community, right, uh, you will have trouble selling all of them. Uh, because many uh, you know, uh, Malays who are in the B40 community cannot afford to buy them. That's right. Uh, and if let's say that structure is not done well, uh, then definitely you will have uh, things like uh, you know, dilapidation of the property because not enough people bought them. Uh, uh, and then the people who can afford them uh, are People can't who, buy them. No, they will go and rent it out. They will buy it and then they will rent it out, you know? And oh, then, yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. That's true that <coughs> you one. Know, rent it out to yes. foreign workers right, or yeah. whatever. And then the conditions of these places will go down very quickly. And then it will be an eyesore, uh, you know, it's uh, property taxes not paid properly. So I, I think the management and the selling strategy needs to be done well. 
uh, and it's got to be given to reputable companies who are able to manage those. Like, and, and they don't necessarily have to be Bumi Putra developers. Uh, they could be JVs, you know, between a, a non-Bumi uh, developer or, uh, you know, a big developer like SP Satya that's owned by or controlled by PNB uh, with uh, maybe a, a smaller developer or some mm. Bumi Putra, uh, you know, uh, companies that are in the construction supply chain. Yeah. Right, and then have some sort of a, a affordable housing model of maintenance that is, uh, you know, more you know more sustainable in the longer term in terms of upkeep, la. So all these policy questions are things that actually we need good people to think about, la, Not That's just right. announce yeah. and after that you expect it to be implemented in a good way. It's pretty much a very complicated thing, la. Yeah, I mean we have seen uh, even in uh, TTDI there are certain areas, right, where they built great buildings but mm. purely under Malay reserve, mm. and you can see suddenly just that piece, it's, uh, the price is a lot lower, mm. Mm. right? Compared to the rest, like 50% lower, right? Uh, I, I, I think uh, it's great if the goal is actually to provide uh, affordable housing to the Bumi Putra community. Mm. I, I think that's fantastic. But I think it can be implemented in such a way where it, it's not just about owning that house in an isolated area, right? But rather, how do you integrate it yes. within the overall society? And I think one of the things that... Uh, I always think that this part Singapore did pretty well is the way they actually structured HDB their housing. La, yeah. Their HDB, where they have uh, actually a racial <coughs> quota yeah. in, in each of the unit. And then building communities that community center that allows people to hang out together, sure. therefore breaking down the racial barrier, right? <coughs> so one way to do this, instead of uh, just focusing on the Bumi Putra community in Malay Reserve land, I think it would make sense, you know, and this is what they've tried to do in some of the Prima developments, uh, mixed record. Uh, to have uh, a certain quota for Bumi Putra uh, sell at a lower price and then you have other quota that is sold in the open market uh, at higher price and then the higher price units can subsidize the lower price units and then part of that subsidy can also go out to build uh, public amenities that are good for that development. That's right. If you just do it 100% Bumi Putra, right, it, will, it will be it will mm. be tough, especially in the in the urban cities in terms of demand, in terms of upkeep and all these uh, issues I talk about, about maintenance. So yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much it for the Bumi Putra Economic Congress. We'll come back and talk about the last topic, which is the EPF dividends that were recently announced. Be right back. Welcome back to the Are We OK Podcast. Now we are the final part of this show today where we're going to talk about EPF recently announced a dividend of 5.5% for their conventional fund. Yeah. There were some mixed comments initially. Mm. Uh, some say like, wow, you all talk about stellar performance but in the end 5.5% only. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? I think we need to perhaps draw the people behind the curtain again. Uh, this is not official EPF policy. This is based on my interactions with different EPF officials over the years. Uh, and um, even though I think returns are based on, you know, past performance, uh, you know, f from the year uh, before, um, what EPF does is that they have this smoothening of the curve. Mm. Meaning, even if let's say the previous year they did very well, you know, uh, internal, uh, you know, numbers show that they actually increased by, let's say, in increase their income returns by, uh, you know, 10 or 12 percent, uh, they would sometimes keep some in reserve, and then what they distribute out to the uh, to the shareholders, to the unit holders, is uh, a little bit less, mm. uh, so that when times are bad, they can have reserve to be able to make sure the uh, the levels are not too bad. So, for example, the lowest we've had in terms of uh, declaration of dividends over the past 15 years is actually in 2009, uh, when the dividend went down to 4.5 because of the uh, global uh, financial crisis in 2008 uh, and the highest I think in the past uh, 15 years was something like 6.5% uh, six, uh, six, 6 or something like that. Uh, so that's why the gyrations are not too too big. So I think 5.5% mm. is more or less uh, there. Mm. It's higher than uh, last year, 5.25% because of the bad, uh, you know, of the bad uh, you know, performance of the equities and bond markets around the world. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite happy with 5.5. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I attended their briefing the other day. Uh, apparently they call this, uh, the statement that they'll make on this is called uh, EPF only pays out the realized profit, not the unrealized mm. profit. But when it's realized, 100% will be paid out to you. Uh, so how do they define realized and realized? That is a uh, internal, internal issue. issue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we know that the unrealized amount is actually uh, higher. Yeah. yeah. The total number is actually higher, but what they're distributing to you guys in cash, yeah. it's actually uh, 
5.5. Now, yeah. uh, and probably the logic is just like uh, what you have mentioned. And mm. and I think actually it's a good move. Yeah. Because the purpose of EPF itself is not for you to like pun stocks and eh, get quick return, you know. <laughs> it's for you to have a steady accumulation. Correct. So that you can withdraw by the time when you uh, retire, you have a good amount of uh, uh, retirement fund. So I, I think sometimes people misread uh, the situation or they do not understand the purpose of EPF and therefore they expect it to perform like the stock market mm. entirely. Now, so this is where I think that the, the comments are not very educated or mm. not very... Informed. La. Not very informed, la, you know. Mm. You need to understand what is it like. Mm. Now, on the other hand also, uh, I was looking at their allocation of funds, right? And... 80 over percent, 88 percent is actually investing in domestic, mm. right? And only 12 percent invested in overseas, for, uh, mm. foreign overseas. Mm. But this time round, their income that they brought in, mm. most of their income are actually overseas. from foreign. Yes, that tells you uh, how good are they in investing. You know, yeah. <laughs> with with just 12 percent, yeah. they are making a lot more money than mm. the domestic side. Mm. And domestic they put under fixed economy, mm. uh, I mean, fixed uh, income. fixed instrument. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. Of, of course All it helps they, they don't they don't have to mark to market la. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay it's okay another behind the curtain now uh, on the other hand is the fact that uh, the foreign side they actually made money hmm. uh, and I think that was quite impressive to me la. yeah so I, I think yeah. it's important to realise this as well uh, as sometimes polit some politicians may call EPF to go and bring back some of their you know foreign investments to come back to Malaysia as a means to uh, shore up the ringgit. I think it may work in the short term, but it comes as an expense. It comes an, as an expense in the form of uh, lower returns for shareholders. Yeah. Right. So this is something that I think uh, EPF is very protective of and I applaud them uh, you know, yes. for doing that. And I think the other thing that's important in terms of, about, uh, in terms of, about EP, in terms of EPF right, is that uh, there's actually other incentives in which uh, you know, they try to encourage us to save more. Mm. Right, so uh, I think it's good that they, you know, even like in the app. I'm not sure. Do you subscribe to the EPF app? Uh, uh, the yeah, but I, but I haven't opened it for a while. I, I tried to open it on that day itself, but I wasn't uh, able to access because of the high volumes. But subsequently, I managed to to do so, and they are quite good in terms of uh, nudging you or you know trying to remind you. You can actually put in more money in EPF. Yes. Uh, do you do you have excess cash or savings in a year? Do you put some in EPF uh, beyond what you, you know? Uh, no, contribute? not now. Not okay. Now. Yeah. So for me, uh, I've been doing that over the past few years. The maximum has been increased to 100,000. Yes. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm not going to say how much I put in there, but definitely when I have excess, I will put in there because it's much better than fixed deposit. Yes. Uh, and, you know, I'm quite, uh, you know, thankfully quite comfortable to know that I don't have to rely on these savings where I can take them out. Mm. Uh, so I, I think it's something that I encourage you guys to do. If you have excess uh, money, yes. just put in EPF uh, and then you'll be able to see the compound, uh, you know, compound right. interest uh, yeah. over time. And a lot of people actually do not know this one thing. When you accumulate more than one, one million in EPF, mm. the remaining of the one million, you can actually take take out as you wish. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. You yeah. don't have to be locked down or bogged down or anything. Yeah. You, you can just take out as long as it has a minimum of 1 million. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so it mm. makes it quite a good FD in that sense. Uh. Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, definitely. More, more, <laughs> yeah, you can earn more. Way, you know, way better, FD. man. Yeah. And you know, if I could, after retirement, I will still continue to, you know, after 60, I will still continue yeah, to put yeah. my money it's in It's a good EPF. passive income place, you know. Yes. And, and yeah. also, I, I think it's good that EPF has also introduced this, uh, you know, um, another account uh, whereby you can uh, have access to it uh, in emergency situations. Mm, you yes. can take it out uh, so that at least EPF can plan. Uh, and I think the reason why they have this account is because they want to preempt the politicians uh, because there have been different calls to you know have allow you to take out money from EPF that has a detrimental effect. Lah. So at least if let's say you have an account uh, that specifies a certain amount going inside, this is your rainy day fund. Lah. That's right. Uh, and then it's capped at a certain limit so that you can continue to accumulate savings in other parts. And if let's say politicians really want you know savings uh, to be accessed by the people, uh, at, there's, there's a fixed amount that is uh, allocated already. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So again, good move on the part of EPF. Kudos to you. One thing I want to highlight, this one possible crisis that okay. is actually coming, okay. which has to do with birth rate. Yeah, so uh, for the... <laughs> So I attended their briefing, right? And for the first time, they actually highlighted this part. They say that uh, there's this thing that's going on, which is 
birth rate is going down. Yes. And Malaysia's birth rate apparently is the decline. Yeah, yeah. the decline yes. is quite bad. Uh, second highest in yeah. Asia or something. That's like right. That. Yeah. yeah. So um for other countries, mostly two, three years ago, they already kind of stabilized. Yes, it's mm. bad, but they stabilized. It mm. did not further fall, deteriorate, yeah. did not further fall. Yeah. But Malaysia is still falling, mm. right? And that's a huge issue because contribution will be a problem. <laughs> yep. And so less younger people contributing while you have a bigger base of older people that you need to pay out, mm. that could cause an issue. So they are saying that they are currently trying to encourage government to come up with more policy uh, to encourage birth Savings. Like, yeah, and, savings yeah. and so on, these kind of things. And and that kind of caught my attention. Uh, it also shows how economy actually is not just about like you think that it's about the dollar and cents. Sometimes the most minor thing, just like giving birth, right? Mm actually does affect the overall economy. Oh, it's an important right? long-term uh, yeah. strategy. You know, look at China now with their one-child <laughs> policy and their attempts to reverse it. It's not easy. Yes. Uh, but <clears throat> here's where I want to uh, highlight one important difference between Malaysia and Singapore savings uh, versus some of the other countries like uh, you know the US, for example. So EPF is a, a defined contribution uh, policy. Uh, other systems such as the US is a defined benefit uh, mm. policy. What was the difference? A defined uh, contribution means you put in the money and then what you are eligible to get out is what you put in, mm. right? So, but for defined, uh, contri uh, defined benefit, you put in a certain amount, <coughs> what you get out of it, right, may be more than the amount that you put in. Meaning, you are entitled to a certain amount of retirement, uh, you know, monthly uh, you know, uh, benefits after you retire. If you survive longer, then you actually get more benefits. Mm. If you survive shorter, then it'll be shorter. So, when the pyramid curves inverts, whereby you have lower number of uh, younger people paying in the, into the system, the defined uh, benefit system will be under more stress. Whereas the defined contribution system, like what we have in Malaysia, uh, thankfully, it will be under less stress. Because yes, uh, yes there will be older people who are taking the money out and the younger people, fewer of them contributing, but still, you know the amount of funds that you have and it won't be sort of like under the kind of strain that a defen defined uh, benefit uh, system will have. La. So I think... Uh, I think uh, EPF is one of our best run institutions. Yep. Uh, we should, uh, you know, give it give it the kind of um, uh, respect that it deserves. Yeah, yeah. I and, agree. And maybe yeah. just one last point. <coughs> Again, everything these days are, is politicized. I'm not sure whether you've uh, received any news or, or any WhatsApp group, uh, you know, circulation on this. Uh, some people have said, oh, the, the non-Sharia income returns is 90%. Uh, of the in re income returns. The the Sharia ones is actually only 11%, right? So how how come the difference between Sharia and non-Sharia is only 0.1%? 5% for, for uh, non-Sharia, 5.4% for Sharia. Have you gotten some of these kind of messages? Uh, no. So uh, I've gotten some of these messages and my response to them is, look, the Sharia part of the investment pool is uh, less than 10 years old. The non-Sharia part has been there since the beginning of EPF. So obviously, there's there's going to be a lower <laughs> investment pool, meaning a lower investment return coming back, coming from the Sharia, Sharia uh, pool. And because they don't have the economies of scale that they've built up in the, Shari uh, the non-Sharia part, then obviously, there, there are going to be some lower returns initially for, for Sharia compared to uh, non-Sharia. And uh, the, the contribution of the non-Sharia part is obviously going to, going to be bigger. So I think when people read these kinds of messages, you really have to have the economic understanding to uh, can check your facts and um, understand these things better. Yeah. <laughs> I think one last thing as well I want to ask you, right? Uh, because you have the exposure of uh, multiple countries, uh, uh, retirement system, social security system, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that EPF is actually probably one of the best in the world? Because when, when I've looked through quite different countries, right? Mm -hmm. I, I personally get this feeling that EPF is probably one of the best because when I look at US, when I look at UK and everything else, right, mm. I, I feel like not 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 that great, lah. not mm. that great, especially in the US, it's really not that great in my opinion. But <clears throat> I feel that although they, they mandatory take 11% and then uh, employer contribution as well, mm. you know, although we don't see the immediate benefit, but actually really, right, it's actually very, very good. I think it's very well run, very professional. Uh, they try to insulate EPF as much as possible from the political pressures, although they come under they came under severe attack during the pandemic with all the demands for withdrawals. But they, I think they managed to toe the line quite a bit. Uh, 
I have a lot of respect for uh, Tunku Ali Zakri, who was the former uh, CEO, uh, you know, before the uh, new CEO who replaced him came in, and uh, Dato Amir, who is now the, the second finance minister. Now we have a, a new CEO who was originally from uh, uh, from Kazana and then went, went to PNB, and now he's the CEO of EPF. Mm. So all of them from professional backgrounds, and uh, I, I'm confident that that trend will continue regardless of which uh, party is in, in power, like, and we should try to, uh, you know, insulate as much as possible EPF from these kinds of uh, political issues. Like maybe just one thing, one complaint that I have about EPF like, <laughs> is uh, their app is good, but actually their online offering sucks. <laughs> the online sort of like uh, registration and, and, you know, responses to, for, 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 the, uh, for accessing it online, right, is not, not so good. Uh, do, you, do you access it online or EPF? Uh, no, no, barely, or, or barely. Through, or through, or through your app? Uh, barely, okay, I barely okay. access it. Yeah. Yeah, so EPF, you're, if you're listening, get the online part you know, on the web part, uh, you know, uh, better. And then uh, maybe the issues that we brought up really happy for your support we're over 16,000 subscribers right now so we're trying to get to uh, 20,000 uh, hopefully you know in a couple of months time that's all and right once again we want to thank Zeus for sponsoring this episode so enjoy yourself see you next week